All right. <clears throat> Next case. 15-year-old girl with collapse. Was it witnessed? <coughs> Let me see. Um, no, it was unwitnessed. Have you eaten today? <laughs> um, so it wasn't today. The, I've eaten today, but the turn was a few days ago. Um, I did eat that day, yes. It's lots of close questions. What about, tell me about what happened to you. Well, all I know is I was just doing my thing, and next thing I know, there was a, you know, I was on the ground, and people found me, and I was a little bit out of it. And what was your thing? What were you doing? Oh, I was... It's not important. Study. I was <laughs> studying. Exactly. I was studying for an exam. Yeah. Did you wet yourself or bite your tongue at all? Um, I did not. Um, how long did it take you to come around? Um, well, I, it, by the time, uh, let's see, let me think about this. Okay, I didn't go to, uh, yep, probably about half an hour. Mm -hmm. And you asked? No. Did you get any warning? <coughs> no. Did you injure yourself? Um, I bit my. Uh, did you ask about him? Really? Yeah. Sorry, no, I didn't bit my. Um, uh, I hurt. Yes, I got a bruise on my right side. Were you incontinent? No. How were you afterwards? I was okay. Initially, I was a little bit confused, but then I was fine. Just a bit groggy for the rest of the day and a bit did sore. You have any headaches or muscle aches afterwards? N uh, muscle aches, yes. but no headaches. Did you have any passive like? Did you have any no. headaches? No, no. Have you started menstruating and do you get heavy periods? I've started menstruating and I have, I think I have regular periods, nothing that I'm... Did you have any seizures as a baby? Uh, no. Any other drugs? No. No fevers or...? No, no fevers, <laughs> been fine. Any family history of, of collapses? Um, my mother gets faint sometimes, and she's had a collapse, I think, when she was in her 20s, but otherwise, no. Would you describe yourself as an anxious person? No. Pretty calm. Any anxiety symptoms? Numbness, tingling, weakness? No. Do you yeah. have any medication or drugs? No. Any funny turns in the past? Uh, well, what do you mean? Oh, you know, just weird things happening to an arm, or people saying that you're not quite there for a few minutes, or... No, no, nothing like that. Mm. What time? Sorry. Have you been taking energy drinks or anything to help you study for your exams? <laughs> uh, well, no, not really, but I have been staying up a bit late mm -hmm. to study, yes. What are you sleeping now? Uh, well, generally I sleep around eight or ten hours, like a good teenager does. Um, but lately it's been more like six because I am quite worried about these exams. Um, so the other thing that you might, so what are you thinking at this point? Neurological. Neurological? So uh, there's a lot of things. That seizure. Seizure, okay. So it could be a seizure. What else? Basal vagal. So, did you want to ask any more around that? Were you really <laughs> distressing? <laughs> Were you studying the articles or something? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, no. Are, are you seriously? Ah, that's you were the sitting, one. Not standing. I was sitting. So that's the one that you want to ask about. Yeah. Are you sexually active? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Are you pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> so it came suddenly, you say, mm -hmm. and you didn't feel funny beforehand. You don't have any idea. No, no warning whatsoever. And when you came to, did you realize what happened, or did you? I, no, I was a bit puzzled by all these people around me. It was my mom and my little brother were right there, and they seemed right. really worried. But they didn't see anything. They didn't see anything. Have you been well prior to this? Completely well. Not increased thirst or 
No. No increased urination. So not likely to be vasodilatory. So, so the one thing that you would, so somebody asked if I'd had funny turns, and then I asked what they were, and it was around focal neurology. So you do probably want to ask if how I respond to seeing blood, or if I've had woozy feelings. You know, so a lot of people have vasovagal episodes have a propensity for those kinds of things. You know, and I have a mother who sounds like she's had a vasovagal thing. So that's probably a biggest differential right now that it was some kind of vasovagal thing, and then you have your seizure. Um, so when now the other thing, obviously, for passing out is what cardiac. Cardiac. So you do want to worry about cardiac, but it's a neurology update, so you're pretty sure it's not a cardiac problem. <laughs> but, um, just stressing that syncope is almost never neurological, um, unless it's vasovagal, which is we could argue is not neurological either. It just doesn't perfuse the brain, so it causes neurological sequelae, but it's not a <coughs> primary neurologic problem. Um, so cardiovascular or neurological, and if it's neurological, it tends to be seizure. Now, there's one other category of seizure that you haven't said. Oh, okay, so good. So like a narcolepsy type cataplexy. So she was, we don't know what time of day it was. She was sitting at her desk studying. So we probably wouldn't think it's cataplexy, but it's, uh, it's a possibility also with that they stay awake, right? So usually you don't pass out with that. You just cannot move. Um, so the uh, what was I? Oh, the, the, so there's epileptic seizures, and then what else is there? Psychogenic, Psychogenic seizures. So could this have been a stress-induced turn because she's had her examination, she's about to go to her examination, she isn't ready, she doesn't want to go, so she puts on the seat. Is that usually more public? It's like a, yeah, a good point. It's a good point. They tend to be more public when you have an audience, but that certainly wouldn't exclude no. um, a psychogenic seizure. And likely to have a bruise anyway. Hmm? And likely to have a bruise. Uh, you'd see, you'd be amazed yes. by how much people go through biting their tongues, and I will talk about that a little bit more. But you're right. So th those are good clues that it was a genuine seizure, unwitnessed, um, post ictal phase bruises. So she injured herself. So I thought I'd show you an EEG because you've probably never seen one before, and this is what we look at. So an EEG looks a little bit like an ECG, except there's lots more channels. Um, and uh, so the, the, this is normal, and if you look at the posterior, so you have uh, posterior rhythm here, um, and you would look at a 10 hertz or 10 cycle per second alpha rhythm that would tell you that the brain is relatively normal, awake state. So this is pretty good background activity. And then she has this discharge here. And what this is is a poly spike and wave discharge. And it's poly because you have these this sort of uh, jagged, they look a little bit like this, but they're narrow, so they're sharper, and they're higher amplitude. So they're bigger. So you have this spike, 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 and then the slow wave. So that's a repolarization. You have the discharge, and then you have a repolarization. I mean, it's, it's visible in essentially all channels with the frontal predominance. And that's typical for a certain type of epilepsy. And there's one other thing you guys didn't ask that you may have asked, that, um, or may not because it's sort of a neurology thing, but um, the, the, most, the two common types of epilepsy that start at a 15-year-old, no prior seizure history, one is temporal lobe epilepsy, and somebody did ask whether there was a seizure earlier in life, so febrile seizures as an infant is a risk factor for that. Um, aura, these people usually have an aura. And then there is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And these people, that's what that is, polyspike and wave. It's diagnostic of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and these people get morning jerks, myoclonic jerks. They do these things, they fling things across the breakfast table. So that's not something they would never volunteer because they don't think it's a big deal and it's just another thing and they don't connect it with their seizure. But it's uh, really useful diagnostically. On the EEG, how often do you see them? Like what's the time frame? Uh, like, can you miss them? Yep, you yep, them? very good question. So EEGs in general have a sensitivity of about 70%. <coughs> So, any, so if you have epilepsy, out of 100 people, 70 will have an abnormal EEG. 
it's higher in these idiopathic generalized epilepsies like absence epilepsy. So childhood absence epilepsy is when you are hyperventilating the kids um, during their procedure and we can trigger the classic three hertz spike and wave discharge. I don't have a picture of that. Um, and that's, gen that's, pretty, that's probably higher than 70% if we can get them to give a good effort so we can induce a seizure. Um, with these guys, it's, it's very high sensitivity. The temporal lobe epilepsies are a bit lower. Um, so you can, the, these are called interictal discharges. Ictus is the seizure, and they're interictal. So they, uh, this is not a seizure. This is just an interictal discharge that tells us that there is cortical irritability. But the key is that the normal EEG doesn't exclude epilepsy. Now, I always put that in my EEG reports because I don't want people to think that. Um, so diagnosing seizures, um, so we've gone through that already. Does it actually fit with the seizure? We did, this particular seizure wasn't witnessed, and she doesn't, didn't have an aura. So all you can really go by is the post-ictal phase, which was witnessed. Um, now auras um, or, are used sometimes called simple partial seizures are these uh, premonitions that you have a seizure. Really, it's already a seizure. It's not nothing pre-seizure about it. It's just a very focal seizure that hasn't done anything else. And the things you read about are metallic taste. I've never seen a patient who actually had that, but that's sort of what reported. But it's actually, I find that more useful for pseudo-seizure because people who've done their homework on it will say <laughs> they've had a metallic taste. <laughs> Um, so what, uh, so deja vu is something you hear about, so the sensation that this is um, something you've experienced before, jamais vu is the opposite, something that should be familiar, that's never, that, that you feel like is completely different, like you're in your house and it seems completely unfamiliar to you suddenly. Probably the most common one I've heard is a rising sensation, so they, and they often do this hand motion, they feel like this, something is coming up. Um, like this, and it's very nondescript, but I've seen it a few times, and, and it's this uh, aura, it's an it's a, uh, autonomic aura. And uh, also a sudden sense of doom, sudden fear, unexplained, those kinds of things. So these psychic, psych, uh, psychic sort of symptoms. Um, blank stares are complex partial seizures, so where you zone out, look into space, or a focal seizure with alteration in consciousness is what we're supposed to call them now. Complex partial seizures have been removed. I'll talk about the new classification. I, I still call them complex partial seizures. But um, uh, so uh, these blank stares, they're not absences. Okay, so absences occur in childhood. Childhood absence epilepsy is a childhood condition. Once in a blue moon, they will continue into adulthood. They may transition into juvenile myoclonic epilepsy and continue to have absences. But absences is a very particular EEG pattern, and adults who have localization-related epilepsy due to a tumor or a temporal lobe problem or a stroke don't get absences. They get focal seizures with um, alteration and level of consciousness or complex partial seizures. Um, so it's, just, it's not really important. We all know what you're talking about. It's just one of those pet peeves. Um, and so and then the fits, so the, the typical fit that happens, let me just, okay. Um, so the, how, does it, how does a seizure look like, right? So this, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between seizure and pseudo-seizure, because pseudo-seizures are really common. Um, and they're kind of going a bit in between the next two slides. So your typical seizure, so you have maybe an aura, you, so you, if you have a partial seizure with secondary generalization, you might have a blank stare, you might turn your head a little bit, arch, your limbs get stiff, that's the tonic phase, and then you jerk. And it's synchronous. It's both arms doing the same thing at the same time. And it's, it's a stiffening of the whole body. It's not bending forward. So people who go like that, lying down, it's not typical. It's usually an arching. Um, and also any hip thrusting, that's really common. People do this, that is not um, typical for seizure. Bicycling movements, you know, it's not typical. Or going like this. So it's sink or head shaking side to side. Not typical for a tonic-clonic seizure. Uh, so it's very classic. They stiffen, 
and that they're often a, a groan before. They might have a little frothing at the mouth. Again, frothing <laughs> happens just as often in pseudo seizure as it does in regular seizure because people kind of know they're supposed to do that. If they turn really bright red and seem really tense, um, that's something I see more in, in um, pseudo seizure than seizure. Uh, but yeah, so, so it's, the key is that it's symmetric um, and synchronous and no side to side. Um, there'll be, if it's a true fit, there'll be post ictal. So if you can see, and the duration. So the duration usually is only about 30 seconds, sometimes a minute, sometimes two, and then that becomes really rare. So a patient who's, and it, it fluctuates, so jerking and calming down a little bit, jerking again, calming down a little bit, and that carries on for half an hour, it's almost certainly uh, non-epileptic. The problem is, if it is, then that's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to have missed that. So at some point, you do need to send them to hospital and for us to take a look. And, and it's, 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 in the hospital, it's challenging too. And so a lot of pseudo-seizure patients get intubated and put into ICU and treated. And it's never a good thing because you can actually cause more harm, obviously, than you're doing benefit. And then they're labeled with epilepsy and then kind of feeds into the whole medicalization of the problem. But um, so the most genuine seizures are quite brief. Um, and then they're post ictal. The tongue biting is something we see. Now, the tongue biting for epileptic seizures is different than non epileptic seizure. So I have seen people bite their tongue um, voluntarily, and they tend to bite the tip. So if you try to imagine how that would be, you know, if the, uh, you know bite like that and get some bleeding. But actually happens in uh, epileptics who fit, they bite the sides of their tongue because they chew with their, with their molars. And so they bite, they chew up the sides of the tongue. And people who've had lots of fits, you can sometimes see that in the mouth. They have actually um, sort of uh, ragged looking tongue edges. Urinary incontinence, uh, th that is not a good sign. It, it makes it helpful perhaps if it's not vasovagal versus um, an epileptic seizure, but it cannot help you differentiate a uh, epileptic versus a non-epileptic because uh, people are really educated about this. So, uh, you know, the, the more there's out there in the public arena as to what real seizures look like, the better our patients get at mimicking them. So, um, which isn't, you know, it's good to educate people, but it's not uh, such a mystery anymore. Sinkable seizure is something that exists. So people who have syncope can get seizure and it doesn't mean they have epilepsy because eventually hypoperfusion of the brain, the brain does not like that and electrical activity will not work very well. So if you have a syncopal event and a couple jerks like that, it's probably a syncopal seizure. Very hard to differentiate them. You do a few EEGs, um, you trigger a vasovagal type symptomatology or blood pressure changes, um, but it can be challenging. Um, so, there's a bit more on pseudo seizures. Uh, different terms for this. Um, I tend to call them non epileptic seizures. So, I, when I have this conversation with people, I'll say there's two kinds of seizures. There are epileptic seizures, which are caused because of uh, electrical problems in the brain, and then there's non epileptic seizures that uh, we don't know exactly what they're caused by, but it's maybe a chemical problem and related to stressors in your life, so on the basis of like a depression type one. Um, well, I, I do think it's a real problem. You know, I don't, I don't ever assume that people are putting them on voluntarily. I mean, you do have the odd patient who's malingering, but uh, it's pretty rare, I think. And actually, it depends on what sort of person you are, I find. That some neurologists think that <laughs> put them on. And I, I don't. I, I just. I think people are good, you know, and I believe that they are truly suffering with this. And that I explain it as a stressor occurring in your life. Um, and usually, they do identify a stressor, and your body is responding to a, uh, a problem in your mind. So I, I don't like to say it's psychiatric because often there isn't overlap with psychiatric conditions. Sometimes there is. But I, I, I <coughs> go the mind-body route, okay, which a lot of, we don't think of it as much in scientific terms, but I think from a lay perspective that makes a lot of sense. 
and I do, we obviously there is a connection between mental, uh, mental processes and physical processes. So we know that the way you're responding to disease affects your mood. And we also know that mood can affect your physical well-being. So I believe that what happens with pseudo-seizures is you're having something mentally that's very stressful that your body isn't coping and it's a cry for help. So you developing a physical symptom to get the attention that and help you need at that time to help cope you with it, but it is an abnormal reaction to illness because that is not actually going to help to address your problem. But we can now go put you on that path by saying this isn't a medical uh, problem in the form of an epilepsy, which is great because it doesn't mean we need to pump you full with toxic medications but it's a sign that this underlying psychiatric problem or stress that you're having needs to be addressed to fix the problem. You can learn to control these seizures as you're gaining more insight, and if you're, um, it, it has a much better prognosis for cure. So I make it a positive thing. But it is challenging, and every patient is a little bit different of how you approach it. Um, so I think that Somebody said that about the trigger um, being unattended. So pseudo seizures tend to occur more in public places in the sur your surgery weight area. It's always a popular place. Uh, in America, we always had, there was this Walmart syndrome. For some reason, people would have them at Walmart. I don't know, maybe at a warehouse here. I don't know. Um, and uh, then there is the soft toy sign I always throw in. Do you know the soft toy sign? No. Mm -hmm. So um, that you wouldn't see this as much, but we see this in the hospital. So when you walk into the room of the patient who's been admitted at ni overnight with intractable seizures, and they're sitting there in their pajamas with their little pattern on it, like little trains or something, a 42-year-old person we're talking, yeah. like an adult in the flannel um, pajamas, and they have their little toys lined up, their little teddy bears on the <laughs> side of the bed. I, I swear, those people have pseudo-seizures until proven otherwise. <laughs> It's actually been reported. This is actually in the literature. Um, also, um, the occupation. You tend to find medical people uh, or nur nurse, the people in the medical profession, in the health profession. So there's a high, high proportion of nurses who have this. And it has nothing to do, it's just there's more nurses than doctors. You know, I think that's, it's not that, but it's people who are familiar with what epilepsy is. Also, people who have epilepsy. A lot of people who have epilepsy then have pseudo seizures on top of it, which makes it really challenging. It's a very common problem. One study said 30% of epileptics will have pseudo seizures at some point or another. So it makes it very challenging. But they know what their seizures are like, so they're very good at, you know, um, at making us think they have more seizures. So, how do you diagnose epilepsy? Um, there, so there's been a change, I alluded to that, in the, in the classification of epilepsies by the International League Against Epilepsy. Sounds like a club of superheroes. But um, <laughs> they uh, have changed the diagnosis to make it fit more with current knowledge of causes of epilepsy. Um, so <coughs> I, I, there's been some consumer feedback that they haven't found this too helpful because they've gotten just used to how to classify their seizures and now things are a little bit different. Um, and I suspect it'll be another 10, 15 years before it changes, and some of you will probably not even heard of the newer one that came out in the sort of mid-90s, so localization-related epilepsy rather than um, a partial epilepsy. Or, you know. so, but anyway, here it goes. So to uh, make a diagnosis of seizure, it used to be that you had to have two seizures more than 24 hours apart to call it epilepsy. So there's seizure and then there's epilepsy, right? Seizure is just the event. Epilepsy is the syndrome, the disease. Um, so epilepsy is a recurrence of unprovoked seizures. Um, so that still is true. So that would give you epilepsy. But you can also, if you just have one seizure and there's clear evidence that you're likely to have another one, then well, can give you epilepsy. Yeah. So that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm just getting there. Um, so that would be, for example, an EEG with a very convincing um, uh, pattern, like that JME pattern I showed you, of that girl <coughs> with a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So she, that is, you don't see that in a normal person's EEG. You have one uh, generalized seizure, you see that pattern, you can say she has juvenile myoclonic epilepsy doesn't mean she'll have lots of seizures in her life, but she's got that diagnosis. Um, or if you have a brain tumor and you have a seizure and it fits with everything. 
so it's just, it's just uh, really, it's still that, but that just in some instances that's helpful. Uh, when people, for example, want to go back to driving, um, you're pretty sure they'll have more complex partial seizures and you say, well, we can actually make that diagnosis. You have temporal lobe sharp waves and slowing. You have temporal lobe mesiotemporal atrophy. Uh, you had febrile seizures as a kid, you know, it all fits and well, let's just go ahead and start treating you now. So and that's sort of something we've been doing for years anyway, but now it's legitimized. Um, now the, the next thing is they've, like the partial seizures, the complex and the simple partial seizures, we, we're not supposed to call them that anymore, they're focal seizures. And um, the reason, so it relates to neuronal networks. So focal meaning on one side of the brain, not crossing the midline. Um, and they're focal with impairment of consciousness or without impairment of consciousness. Um, and then generalized hasn't changed. So generalized, the only thing there is generalized sort of um, implies that it's all over the brain, which isn't necessarily the truth. Certainly absence epilepsy is not all over the brain. They wouldn't be able to stand up, but it does involve both hemispheres, and it's usually a thalamic neuronal networks that cross the midline, which is why they lose consciousness for that brief second, but maintain tone. Um, so focal versus generalized is fairly similar, except we're moving away from partial. And then we've been calling seizures that are based on a brain tumor, for example, localization-related epilepsy. I don't know if you've heard that term before. Um, that's what I mean. I, many of you will not even that familiar with that. Uh, we, we now call them structural epilepsies or metabolic epilepsies versus genetic. So juvenile myoclonic epilepsy would have been an idiopathic generalized epilepsy. In the old terminology, it predicts a good prognosis, normal cognition, no structural brain pathology. It's on a genetic basis due to channelopathy, due to a membrane instability in the brain rather than a lesion. Um, generally, pretty good prognosis, generally easier to control with medications. But idiopathic <coughs> it sort of implies we don't know what causes it, but we actually do know what causes it. So it's not very, spe very specific, so that's been replaced by genetic. Um, the syndromes themselves, like juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, have remained the same. And then one other thing has been added. You can actually now be cured. Um, so if you have a syndrome that is age-restricted, so for example, benign Rolandic epilepsy um, is something that occurs in childhood and is outgrown. So then you can say the patient no longer has epilepsy. They've been cured from their epilepsy. Um, or if you've been seizure-free for 10 years, five of which were without, last five were without medication, you can say that epilepsy has gone away. And there's, that is relevant to you. So you have these people who have had no seizures for 30 years. Um, maybe they've stopped their medication at some point. Do they actually still have epilepsy? And now we would say no. That's a problem with young people trying to go into the armed forces. They've got a history of benign rolandic epilepsy. And you try to say to the army, no, they don't have it any longer. And you know, they demand neurology reports and you know, just ridiculous hopes they have to jump through something they haven't had for 10 years. Can you tell the army that they're good? And all the insurance. It's the sort of thing that, when I talk, I'll have one slide later on about how to work together with the specialist. I mean, that's the sort of thing we'd be very happy for you to write to us and we just write a letter. You know, we wouldn't need to see the patient. We could just write a letter documenting that, lo looking. And, and I mean, to be fair, um, you know, it's, it's they flying planes and, and whatnot. I mean, they, they have a lot of liability and they want to be really sure that, um, that the diagnosis was accurate and that's all, so it doesn't come up that often. I mean, it's, I don't find that so, Unreasonable, and we'd be ha we, we Generally, I mean, we get these requests, and we just write a letter and take. Well, this the recent one insisted they have a neurology assessment What's because the time frame they had to go privately, which yeah. cost a lot of money. Yeah, so that I think I think it should be then at the discretion of the GP and the specialist together how they want to handle that. And I disagree that they have to have a face-to-face -face assessment yeah. if you look at the EEG. So I'm with you. Mm -hmm. we can see what we can do about that. Um, okay. And so what do you do when you have your seizures? You, people ask, was there anything before? So that's helpful from a diagnostic perspective. Um, do you always want to ask for blank stares? Somebody did ask, so that was very good. Um, so you get your EEG in the first instance. The EEG 
shows uh, generalized epilepsy like the um, girl in our case, you don't need to do anything further. We do not need to scan. It's so accurate diagnostically that we wouldn't need to scan her. Um, but if it's normal or if there's a focal abnormality on the scan, we would generally scan them. And, and um, for these patients, it's useful to do an MRI scan rather than a CT. A CT is just to rule out a brain tumor, and in 15-year-olds, that's almost never the case. It's more likely to be um, a temporal lobe uh, sclerosis or a, um, embryonic, uh, like a dis, um, uh, uh, like a migration, a cortical migration problem with gray cells. Um, in the wrong place, causing a seizure focus, and none of that you can see on CT. So I would skip the um, CT, but I'd do the EEG first to avoid some unnecessary imaging. And this then might the be, oh, sorry, it's slightly obvious, but if, if you're very confident it was vasovagal, you wouldn't go for the EEG? No. 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 We definitely don't want to do EEGs in everyone who has vasovagal syndrome. No. And I wouldn't. So if I see them in clinic and I think it's cardiac or a vasal vagal, I wouldn't do an EEG. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes you have to do these things because of people have been told you're going to get an EEG and then it's just easier to do the EEG. You know. um, driving, so the driving step down is one year after any kind of seizure, and that applies to pseudo seizures as well. Um, but you can, so this is another one of those things that actually annoys me a little bit more. So you have to have a neurologist clear you earlier. Um, so we, we do do that after six months, but I am actually very strict around this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there are places in the country where this is a real problem. You know, if you're thinking of the South Island, I will say that if you live in um, Otaki, or let's say you have trains there, but if you live in Dannyburg, and I used to work in Mid Central, that's a problem too. Um, you don't have to live on the South Island, or if you live somewhere in the Midlands region, you know, it's a real major problem. Um, but I have had people die. I've had people die after having had a seizure in the car, and I've had people kill other people. So I think that you have to just remind yourself, and you want to be compassionate with the person in front of you. But the only time I ever clear people after six months is if they had frequent seizures and they've completely stopped. Uh, so frequent as in they've had more than one. So if they've had one seizure and then you start them on medications, um, you don't know how often they have them. So they could have them at nine months, the next one. So it's a kind of, uh, maybe it's unfair, but that leaves me a little worried. If they have them every, if they have them once a week and they start a medication and they stop completely, you have more confidence that they've actually stopped. Yeah. Um, if they have no alteration of consciousness, uh, they still need to be seizure free, but I'm a little less worried about them having one of those. Um, and, uh, yeah, pretty much, and or if I'm really sure they're pseudo seizures, and even without treatment, I might allow them after six months. So it is there isn't really a set of rules, which is probably why we do get involved. Um, so is there any rationale to the one year thing? Uh, sort of. Month? Yeah, no, there is. There's a, um, a rationale. So we know that if you look at seizure recurrence, it's it's early, it's most likely early on, and then it drops off. And by two years, if you haven't had a seizure in two years, your risk is back to where the most people is, I mean, almost, um, one second. Um, so, uh, so, that, so two years would be the safest, um, and then one year is kind of a compromise. So that's and the rationale. And the six months is like the fine tuning details that you might be looking, you just. Yeah, just so six months is, um, is riskier than one year, but because it's been a significant period, if you haven't had any further, you're just playing your odds, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And after head injury, there's been no seizure activity, but they get, they get stood down for... Yeah, so I don't deal with those so much. Um, so, but, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what... But they think it's three months, isn't it? No, I don't know. My last significant injury is told a year, but they let him after six months. Yeah, I don't know. So it's really... Obviously, if it's a mild concussion, it's not like that. But if you have, um, like, a neurosurgical procedure, then neurosurgeons usually deal with that. I don't know. Is there any evidence that people who have had pseudo seizures are more likely to have car accidents? Not that I'm aware of. But you'd, yeah. the, the reason for it is not so much because you think that they'll have a problem with a car accident, but because you're never so 100% sure it couldn't be a seizure. Yep. Um, Fair enough. 
What about diving? I mean, I know it lives in a contraindication yeah. of diving. Is that a lifelong contraindication? No, so uh, you so mean, oh, you mean like under like scuba, scuba diving? diving. Mm. So I haven't actually thought specifically about that. I've thought a lot about swimming out in the ocean, which is sort of similar, not quite. But basically, there are two kinds of restrictions. There's the restrictions that are putting you at risk, and then there's the restrictions that put others at risk. And when others are at risk, legislation comes in. So, uh, so that's also private land. So if you're a farmer and you drive a uh, vehicle on your land to check your fences and your sheep, uh, it's much less strict because it's your private land and you're unlikely to hurt anyone else. So what I do is I recommend to people uh, that they definitely step down for three months with things like swimming in the ocean and those kinds of things, seeing how things go, preferably six months and ideally one year. And then I have that discussion with the individual and the parents, you know. So it comes up and kids, um, you know, swimming is a big one. There's the bathing too, you know, I mean, tub baths. Now, a lot of people don't do that anymore, but uh, the, that's, I've had a patient once who had a seizure standing up in a shower, but it was in a tub. He was showered in a tub and he fell and clogged up the, the, the drain and the water rose and he drowned because nobody was in the house and witnessed this. So, you know, I recommend for at least the first three months that people don't do, leave the door um, unlocked, tell people when they're going to have a shower and not do it when nobody's at home. Usually people hear it, you know, when people collapse, but especially with children. Uh, the, oh, the other thing I didn't mention, did I have that? Um, is you know, SUDEP. So SUDEP, have you heard of SUDEP? Sudden Unexplained Death in Epilepsy. So it occurs in, um, what I think on the next slide. So one in 1,000 people with epilepsy yeah. suddenly die without clear reason. Yeah. Not very common, but it does happen. Well, I've actually had two patients, mm -hmm. one in London and one in... Yep, so uh, I've had patients, so it does yeah. happen. It's not that rare. No. Um, and what we don't really 100% know what happens, but we think it's probably a cardiac problem, in fact, rather than a primary brain problem. And it ha happens in sleep, and they don't wake up, and we just don't find another explanation. They have had epilepsy, and we found that it's a quite high proportion of people at a young age dying suddenly without anything other in common than the fact that they have epilepsy. So we conclude it's related to the epilepsy, and we think it's probably a uh, arrhythmia in the heart, but there's still research going on in that area. The most important message here is it's much higher if you're untreated. So if you have pretty bad epilepsy, uh, with relatively frequent seizures, and I mean, if you, if you have had a one-time seizure and you don't take treatment for that, it's probably not that high. But if you have frequent complex partial seizures um, and are untreated, your risk can be one in 150. So that's something you want to tell people when you counsel them about starting seizure medications. So treating epilepsy, um, so I generally do like to wait for the second seizure because it's only the, the risk of a recurrence is only 50% after the first seizure and then it goes up the more seizures you have. Um, so I like to wait at least um, three months or so but sometimes people are really worried about it or they're really eager to get their license back and then you might have to do um, other things like starting them and then wait six months. Um, you know, people have, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about, misperceptions out there about epilepsy. It still has quite a lot of stigma. Um, so people think if they have epilepsy, that means they're mentally um, impaired, that they cannot hold jobs, uh, that they're somehow inferior, people don't like talking about it. So I, it's, a, it's a big deal to be diagnosed with epilepsy, although I try to say it's not a big deal and you can have a really normal life. If, we're going to just try and get these seizures under control. I tell kids, you just have to grow up a little bit faster because you're going to need to take this medication. But once we get it under control, you can be just like everybody else. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you won't be able to succeed in life. It just means that you have to be a little bit more responsible than your peers and help you grow up quicker and make you more successful in the long run. So I try to make it um, a, a positive spin without minimizing the problem. Sometimes the parents are the ones who are more upset the, the child, uh, so uh, dealing with that. Choosing a drug, um, so I went through all that business about talking about the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy because the generalized epilepsies 
um, treated differently than, than focal onset epilepsies. And I don't know if you know this, but so not all drugs work for all types of epilepsy. And that's actually one of the key teaching points. So um, if you're not sure what type, and that's why we go through effort to figuring out what epilepsy is. We don't just do that because we, you know, are really nerdy people who like to know lots of detail, but we're actually trying to pick, pick the best um, drug for the patient. And if you have, gen if you have e generalized epilepsy, specifically phenytoin and carbamazepine can make things worse. And there's nothing worse than having a new patient with epilepsy, giving them drugs and having them have more seizures uh, as far as faith in the medical uh, profession, you know. So, uh, and plus, of course, it's not great either because they have, might get more injured. So you want to be careful about that. And if, you, if you're desperate to start, so, so I would generally say somebody with new onset epilepsy probably should see a neurologist at least once to have that discussion to make that diagnosis, diagnosis and pick the first drug because it is complicated. There's like 10 or so, they're all a little bit different. Um, they all have different side effect profiles and I wouldn't expect that you remember all of that. Um, but if you feel that you need to start somebody relatively quickly, Epilim is a good choice because it's a broad spectrum drug that treats both generalized and partial seizures. So Epilim 200 milligrams BD, titrating to 500 milligrams BD over a couple weeks is a, is a reasonable choice if you're struggling getting access to a specialist. Um, the other one that's a good drug is Leviteracetam that you're probably less familiar with. Um, and that's uh, also one that's broad spectrum. It's been trialed primarily as an add-on medication and in focal <coughs> epilepsies, but we use it all the time in generalized epilepsies. And that's those 250 milligrams BD and also increased to 500 BD. So quite similar to Epilim. And it does you not. Use it for your focals. Um, if you're not sure, you can use it for either. Yes. And it's Kepra. Kepra, yeah. Uh, and that doesn't cause. I mean, that doesn't seem to be as bad with the birth defects, although it's in early days. The, um, so and let's see. That's when it gets complicated, and I don't want to spend the next hour talking about drugs, what to use in young females, and side effects. But that'll bridge them at least till they see one of us. Um, the, uh, we mostly pick them, uh, so we pick by type of epilepsy and then side effect profile. That's the main, main way that we select them. Also interaction with other medications, if they have kidney problems or if they have liver problems, we will pick either a renally or hepatically cleared drug. There's a lot of drug interactions with anti-epileptics. And just because they don't take any other drugs doesn't mean they don't have drug interaction because they all interact with one another too to just make it more fun. So the, the case in point is if you have your phenytoin and your epilim and then you check drug levels. And one day they're there and another day they're there and you never know what to make of it and they heavily interact. So it's very uh, difficult to make any sense of drug levels when you t use them together. Um, but a word on dr checking drug levels. So. Um, in general, another key message about epilepsy is just don't. Just don't check drug levels unless you have a really good reason because it generates a lot of angst. Um, so if you think the patient is non-compliant and you keep increasing the drug and it's not working, that is an excellent reason to check a drug level. Because if they have nothing in their system, you can be pretty sure they're not taking the drug. Um, and can a patient take it a few days beforehand or a day beforehand and have normal levels? Depends on the drug and so the half life of the drug. So if or epilim, yes. can you up your levels enough to have a yes. good t test result? Uh, well, you can, it up, you can take enough a few days before to have a detectable level that would not yeah, give you confidence. Right that uh, you, know, you might say it's a bit low and you might push it up, but that's exactly the thing that I would avoid. Um, so adjusting it based on the drug level. Uh, so yes, the, you, you, the, if the patient is sufficiently motivated, they could do that, yes. Um, and sometimes they are, but uh, so looking for non-compliance and toxicity is the other one. So especially, if, especially phenytoin and carbamazepine. Those are the drugs that cause drug toxicity. And if they are a bit drowsy, staggery, or have diplopia, uh, you do want to check a level to see if they're toxic. And especially phenytoin is a dangerous one in that regard because it has this funny zero-order kinetics 
where it kind of just goes along, goes along, rises, and then suddenly you reach a threshold and it skyrockets. So you might have a level that is within the therapeutic range or even low therapeutic range, and then you just increase it a little bit, and then you're completely toxic the next uh, a few days later. So you have to be a bit careful. But we want to discourage phenytoin in general because it has <coughs> long-term effects on bone health, um, gum health, and uh, cerebellar atrophy. So, so we don't like phenytoin very much. The one redeeming quality of phenytoin, or the two, are that it's once a day, which for some people who have poor compliance, that's a real big deal. Um, and you can easily convert it to intravenous when they come to hospital. Uh, so it's still, it still has a place, but I would avoid it as much as you can. Um, so, so those are the, you can check levetiracetam levels, you can check lamotrigine levels, uh, you can check topiramate levels, you certainly can check epilim levels. Epilim levels is another one of those, we don't really know what the range is. So you get a slightly low one and then you think, oh, you should push it up. But you know we don't we don't really know that low epilim doesn't work, and we don't really know that high epilim causes toxicity unless it's super high. So it's I, I just avoid it unless you have the situation. And one other time it's useful is if you have a pregnant woman, and you want to monitor to keep the try trading the drug up as they grow, um, so it can be useful. Not do anything about the patient that's been on phenytoin and phenytoin for forty years, and they haven't had a seizure, and are now seventy five, and nothing else yeah. is wrong with them. Yeah, so this is a really, this is not an uncommon problem. Um, and there's, the, I, there's no a right answer to this. And I've done it both ways. I've kept them on it, you know, it's been working fine. Why change now? I've also titrated them. Usually what I find happening is you don't do anything unless something then happens. So they then get sick or they have um, interactions with other drugs that are a problem that, that prompts you to make a change. Um, so I try to prevent this from happening so that if somebody has had no seizures for five years, I will have that discussion with them to streamline their regimen. We don't put people on phenobarbital anymore or phenytoin, but I think these people will just slowly die out and then hopefully we don't have that problem anymore. I don't have a perfect answer for you. But, but the thing that actually the problem that then arises, somebody then checks the levels, right? <laughs> so you've had, they've been for 30 years on these drugs and then they check a level and the phenytoin is low or it's a little bit high, but they have no symptoms. And, and so I just make the decision you were going to make without the levels. It's, and phenytoin and uh, phenobarbital, again, heavily interact with each other. They compete for protein binding. So one day it'll be high, another way day will be low. And all I can say is use, look at the patient. You know, if the patient looks fine, ignore the levels. One of the problems, I look after some, some um, houses with people with intellectual disability and they've got high rates of epilepsy. And they get taken into ED because they're having a seizure. And they're on some old-fashioned drugs. And they'll suddenly increase the phenotone. So I know when I find the ED method, they'll be phenotone toxic yep. for three days. Because it happens every time they reach the levels. It does. And you don't have to stop ED doing this. So don't increase the phenotone. You phenotone. can tell me how to influence what ED oh. does. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, but it's fair enough. I mean, you know, they don't know the patient. They've just shown up with um, a seizure. They, they're trying to do the right thing. But we're trying to encourage them is that if they change to their medication, they'll call us. And then we try to avoid that and say, let's just leave it be. Maybe they just have a respiratory infection. And, let this. and we all know that these people with dis intellectual disabilities, we harm them a lot more than help them by well, increasing the <laughs> And they put on antibiotic just to ensure that they'll be toxic. <laughs> Sorry. We do education with them as well. <laughs> um, just the same uh, question as Bernard at a younger age, because I was a woman in the early 40s, and the last week, I was thinking, come on. That was seizure for 20 years, and I said to her, I think we could probably withdraw this. And a woman in big life, he'd be more concerned about her bone, to you, than perhaps a seventy-five-year-old who drives. So the driving is. Would you tend to add something else in and then withdraw the No, no, that's why I think you've been Oh, so, so you have several options. You can either do not, you can do DEXA scans, which are hard to get. You know, mm -hmm. and you can give her vitamin D and calcium to protect her bones. And, and we know that actually does help in that situation. And in fact, everyone on these drugs should be taking that. Um, so you can pr prevent that. You can taper the drug, and then you have this driving problem. So I usually tell people to stop driving while we're tapering, and then ideally for six months. And that's a hard one. Yeah, it's a huge, in New Zealand, we just 
I know, I know. It's not just New Zealand. It's lots of places. And so it's a real challenge. But I wouldn't feel comfortable tapering it without at least three months of, depends on how frequent those seizures were beforehand. But you, you cannot, I don't think you can justify it because you don't know if they're seizure free because they've been on the drug. The one thing you can do is you can do an EEG first, and we usually will do that. And if the EEG is completely normal, then that gives you some confidence. If they've never had anything on brain imaging, so you wouldn't repeat that, but they'll have had brain imaging at some stage likely, if that was normal, then um, you, you feel more confident. But I would say I, I would not feel comfortable taking that risk. And, and so the, the other option is to swap them to something else, and that's what somebody else was saying. So you could say, well, all right, well, let's stop the phenytoin and put you on a low dose of levetiracetam. If you, if you do that, you still got to get them to stop driving. Not sure. necessarily, no. no. So you don't have to stop people from driving when you switch seizure medications, unless you have a thing. It's, it's, all of this is a bit patient specific, you know. So if there's somebody who's tried three times before to switch medications, had seizures every time, then yes, I would stop them from driving. But in somebody who's been seizure free for 20 years and I have concerns about side effects, I have a pretty low index of suspicion that they'll have a seizure anyway. And then I get an EEG and it's normal, and they've only ever had two seizures to begin with in a normal scan. I would, that would be a compromise I'd be willing to make. But it's not, it's based on experience. Okay, uh, I think surgery, just the last thing. So epilepsy surgery, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you fail two um, drugs, you qualify for surgical evaluation. Now, only very few types of epilepsy are actually amenable to surgery, but it is potentially curative. So it's something to consider. And that's another one of those things that if you deal with uh, adjusting medications out in the community, you want to keep that in mind that that's something else we can offer through the um, hospital. Uh, not at all. They do just in Auckland, but we have connections. We can send them up there. I've done this on a number of people.